Welcome to the Microsoft IT Pro Podcast, a show about Office 365, Azure, and the IT Pro and end user side of life. Each week, we'll discuss a different topic or recent news related to Office 365 and Azure and how it relates to you as an IT Pro. The Microsoft IT Pro Podcast is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. So, what's going on? Not a whole lot. I last talked to you about 10 minutes ago. Yeah, you sound suspiciously stuffed up, just like you just did. (laughs) Yeah, just like the last episode. The secrets of podcasting. When your wife is having a baby, you record multiple episodes back to back, so you don't have to record them right after the baby's born. Through the magic of time travel, though, it feels like it's been a week. It does, and to all of our listeners, it probably feels like it's been a week, because reality is it has been. (laughs) That it has. It does make it hard with how fast the cloud moves because in four weeks, the stuff we talk about might not even be accurate anymore. Accurate or available. These are all true things. But uh, yes. yeah, since it's been a whole week since we last talked, let's change gears a little bit and go back to Azure. All right. So speaking of new things, there are some new things out in preview in Azure around networking. Yeah, yeah. These have been kind of kicking around on the back end for a while in in private preview. So they've been vetted and and pushed through. And here they come out on the front end in all of their glory in public preview. So two really cool new services, especially if you're kind of into core networking and security and, and all those good kind of things within the Azure space. So there were two announcements or really one announcement rolled up into two new services slash products. I guess one's a service, the other one's probably more a little bit more of a product that came out and, and run along. So these are Azure Virtual WAN and Azure Firewall. Which one do you want to start with? Let's start with the Virtual WAN or the, well... It falls under that category of an SD WAN. It is because it is a software defined service and, and all pushed up and ready to go. You mean stuff in Azure is all software defined? There's no hardware that we have to deal with when we're working with Azure. Well, you can. You can go ahead and get an Azure stack. It's 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 up to you. You know, you that's can true. Have your cake and eat it too. All right. Yeah. So software defined a WAN. What is it? It's basically taking the SD WAN offerings of other partners and giving them the ability to connect into Azure as your hub point. So if you have multiple branches, like you're doing branch to branch connectivity on your WAN today, and say you're using uh, like riverbeds, like steelheads or something to go ahead and make that happen, yep. you can optionally go ahead and roll out this service, Virtual WAN, and actually connect through Microsoft's network, which gives you some interesting possibilities. Because no matter how big your provider is today, chances are they're going to be like, a little bit smaller than Microsoft's. I'm, don't get me wrong, some are really big. I think Microsoft is currently the second largest dark fiber network in the world. So, like maybe if you go to somebody, like I think if you went to CenturyLink's, got to have a really big like like fiber network running around. But I don't know who number one is. But they're basically number two, number three. So they get a lot of stuff kicking around. If you think about Azure with its 54 data centers or 54 regions today, that's all well and good. But when we think about that connectivity on the other side, there's actually about 70,000 miles of fiber that are driving connectivity between all of those. And it's not just a connection between region to region. There's a bunch of edge points that exist within there as well. So there's 130 edge points, which is where you see all the CDN services from Microsoft come out. So you get some cool options for global connectivity when you go ahead and if you choose to go down this path. So what you could do is you could take branch A and go ahead and connect it to branch B and use Microsoft as the hub to tie all that together all in a software defined service. So just a a full mesh like like a hub spoke mesh that can spin up with Azure driving all of the configuration or your vendor like let's say like Riverbed or or Cisco whoever or Citrix whoever it happens to be driving the configuration directly into Azure and then having all your monitoring APM all all the other kind of stuff that you would have in place. So like if you've ever configured a site to site VPN 
in Azure, whether you're doing like Azure to Azure connectivity or you're doing maybe like ground to cloud kind of stuff to go ahead and spin things up. It's a little bit weird. You got to pick your gateway type. Is it, you know, static? Is it dynamic? What's the routing? Are we going to do BGP? Do we have to, you know, what's the shared key? Does my device support it? What's, what's all that look like? Well, in this case, you don't have to worry about it because I'm already with Riverbed and I'm already on a WAN product or, or a product that supports WAN. So they'll go ahead and handle all the IP set connectivity and everything else that I need to have in place to make a product like this works or a product like this works. So now what I can do is have a VNet in Azure, all my stuff in my VNet, and I can control all the routing, have it come back to on-prem if it needs to come back to on-prem. I can go branch to branch, having that connection run through Azure. But the coolest thing about running through Azure, again, is you got those 130 points of presence or, or pops out there. So branch one, it's going to go to its closest pop, and then it's going to hit Microsoft's fiber, and it'll basically just be limited by the speed of light at that point. Point, traverse all the way across until it hits the other pop point and comes out and goes down to the other branch. Okay, so the Azure Virtual WAN, is this a pure Microsoft service or is it one of those things where you still have to bring your own license, your own key for, like they, it looks like they rolled this out initially in partnership with Citrix and Riverbed where you're still bringing a Citrix license or a Riverbed license for a WAN, but then just doing it as a software defined way on right in Azure or is the Azure one kind of its own separate service alongside of Citrix and Riverbed? Its own separate service, but the configuration is driven by those partner devices and, and partner products. So really you wouldn't want to use this just kind of on its own. You would want to have something like Riverbeds in all your locations or Citrix NetScalers or, or things like that in all your locations to go ahead and, and drive that connectivity and have it get to where it needs to be. Realistically, like spinning up a whole like software find WAN and, and, and like an SDN WAN service with all the routing and everything isn't something that you're just going to take on as, as a service on the side. But the really cool thing about this, like I said, is say you're already using Riverbeds and you have a hundred yep. locations. So you'll go into Riverbed and, and you'll go into your devices and you'll actually have all those locations configured. And then it's basically one or two clicks. I mean, it's really that simple for like the, the demoware that Microsoft has out there right now for this and, and Riverbed or Citrix as well. They, they actually had demos from both of them. You click a button and it pushes all that configuration straight into Azure. And then as soon as it's in Azure, within seconds, you've got all that connectivity with Azure as your hub between all those pops just got spun it. up. It's like snapping your fingers and boom, it's lit up. Okay, So it's really super cool. So I mean, you're talking about deploying virtual WAN and then using these devices to kind of help manage really the IPsec tunnel because it's it's IPsec connectivity today. Like this is an express route. This is kind of like IPsec plus or like Azure site to site VPN plus because we're you know having all the mesh configured for us and pushed in. So you know you'll go ahead and create your WAN. You'll deploy your virtual hubs. So basically, like where do I want my hubs to be and like which pops do I want them to be associated with those kinds of things? Because we want to drive you into the pop that's closest to your branch office. Microsoft doesn't know that. You're you're the one who knows that and and can push it all through. So, you know, WAN comes up, hubs come up and hubs become your point where traffic terminates before either heading into an Azure VNet or through Microsoft's backbone out to another pop and out to a another branch. But okay. really the the automation thing's probably one of the coolest things about this. Got it. So are all those pops then defined by like the different data centers in the different regions or is that outside of those data centers? How do you find like where you should create those to connect your how do you find that list to figure out which one is closest to you? Uh, it's all surfaced like within the portal. Okay. It's not necessarily, it's Microsoft owned stuff, right? It, it, it's their edge locations and everything else. It's not like you're going on to like, going to like Akamai or something like that. Yep. But it's not a Azure or Office 365 data center because there's not 130. Azure regions today. There's only 54. Well, that's what I figured. I was like, that's a lot more pops than there are regions and yeah. data center. Well, we don't know about data centers. We just know regions. Yeah, it's kind of piggybacking on existing infrastructure and, and the CDNs and everything that have been built out. And Microsoft's really been working on that. I mean, if you think about products in Azure, take something like, oh well, like Azure CDN. That right. used to be Akamai 
and Verizon. Like you would go to Microsoft and you would purchase it, but it would say, "Hey, do you want to do the Akamai version or do you want to do the Verizon version of Azure CDN?" And you're like, "Huh, that's kind of weird. I just want to use the Microsoft version of Azure CDN." As they've built out the CDN network, you can do things like that today. Okay. And like we said, this is with Citrix and Riverbed. They're working to bring it to Barracuda, Checkpoint, Palo Alto, Silver Peak, Versa. All those other other providers will hopefully have the same functionality, be able to deploy to that Azure from those as well here in the coming months. Yeah, they'll have the ability. Most of it's going to be about where you want to fall within the ecosystem, right? So if I'm using something like riverbeds, I'm probably using steelheads for other things besides just WAN. I'm I'm doing some kind of traffic optimization or I'm doing some edge caching or some other things or maybe I'm even using those devices to run other virtual machines or I'm doing APM. I'm just doing other things with them. So you're already going to be in this vendor ecosystem. So the cool thing is if you're in this ecosystem and you're an Azure customer, it gives you a great way to, to light things up. So like I'm I'm thinking, you know, when I used to work for the transportation company, we had 125, 130 locations all over the world. Every single one of those had a steelhead and we were a Microsoft customer. So all my things with like branch to branch connectivity where we were just kind of driven out of having the steel heads connect to each other, now you could actually drive that. It's still an IPsec connection, it still goes over the internet, yes, but yeah. I could have driven that really remote location in like Alaska, maybe potentially into a closer pop point and then had them traverse all the way back down to, you know, Seattle or Jacksonville or New York or Philly, you, you know, basically wherever their traffic had to come in and and where it had to lay out. Right. Hopefully speed up that connection significantly by leveraging Microsoft's network rather than that point to point connectivity. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. That would I don't have any locations with that many points to try something like this with, nor the funds to go buy a bunch of that stuff. But <laughs> well, I can definitely I, I'm, I'm see not saying you need mm-hmm. hundreds of locations. It's just if you're doing point to point connectivity and you've been either wanting to experience things like this or you're already in some of these vendor ecosystems and you're a Microsoft customer, there's, there's a bunch of like ands and ifs and things like that in here. And this is definitely a preview service. This is not a production service at this time. Like I said, it's not Express Route, it's only IPsec today. Caveats abound, but this is a really good one to kind of see it pushed out and out in the wider world. Yeah, and do they have, I was just looking, they have pricing details right now. While it's in preview, it looks like it's all free. Yeah, yeah. With no tech support and no SLA. So like you said, it's preview. It is very, very much preview. I would expect that you'll probably see pricing line up with other Azure services. So, you know, we don't pay for ingress, but we do pay for egress. I always get those two backwards. I might have it backwards again. But you only pay for traffic like one way in Azure. So you're still gonna have that. You're still you're technically spinning up really like all those IP sec tunnels. So there's gotta be some compute to drive the gateways on the back end. So you're gonna be charged for just like you probably would be today for VPN connectivity or Express Route or things like that. This will probably end up being a really nice middle ground. Like if you don't need Express Route, but you want some of the the ability to burst through Microsoft's network for your kind of for your hub, that'll be a, a really good way to do it. Yeah, and it looks like they mentioned some of the VPN gateway pricing on there around that during preview, customers will continue to get billed for existing VPN gateway meters. So if they do end up doing it something similar to the VPN, it maybe it'll even be based on that bandwidth. Because it looks like right now VPN is based on the bandwidth you want over your VPN connection, even more so than the ingress or egress of data. So we'll see. Yeah, Express Route's built the same way based on bandwidth. Yeah, a couple other things. So if you're going to go and check this out, there's no support in ARM templates for this today. So you do have to drive it through other automation, you know, like PowerShell or or preferably through your vendor device. So you know, you're you're going to have options, like I said inside like Riverbed and Citrix today to basically go ahead and do that provisioning and have it run up all your configuration in Azure. And that's probably your best bet because it's not just the Azure configuration, but it is kind of dependent on the configuration of those devices being right as well. So you're going to want to have that in place and and ready to go. Yeah, with Citrix and those, since it is pushing stuff up, 
is there do you know if there's updates to those devices that you need for them to be able to function with it or I didn't catch it might be out there in in the documentation I just watched a webinar on this stuff yesterday or, or the day before and they really didn't dive into specific versions of devices or things like that they just kind of said ooh shiny here you go we're up and running yeah and I was looking at the Citrix page where they talk about this too and it's not it's pretty vague on there yeah <laughs> so vagueness abounds. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but very much so. It is a preview service, and like I said, it was kicking around like you know, like most services do. Like you know, people do use these before they come out and and they hit public preview. They start internally at Microsoft. They go through private preview, things like that. So it's not like there have it hasn't been kicked around. It just hasn't been kicked around widely. <laughs> yep. And here's a link too from Citrix. We can add this to the show notes. Citrix has a page on getting started with it with a link to some short setup instruction videos and some other links too right on Citrix site. Guess and Riverbed has the same thing. So if you want to learn more about this, we'll put this in the show notes. So if you go to msclouditpropodcast.com forward slash episode 78, you'll be able to get to all the links for these different articles, videos, all of that. Mover is a cloud migration company that specializes in moving your company's files from file servers or cloud storage like Box, Dropbox, and Google into Office 365. Their patented technology makes Mover the fastest OneDrive file migrator in the world. Moving dozens of terabytes of data a day is a breeze. Use Mover's free, industry-leading migration guides or ask for a managed migration and they'll take the lead. With Mover, all your data is secure and intact. Running completely behind the scenes, you don't lose time, money, or hair while you transfer. Scan, plan, migrate, report. Migrations that don't suck with Mover. Visit mover.io for more info. So there was another announcement that was bundled in that single blog post about Azure Firewall, which is another new preview feature. Yes, and this one has me even more excited than Virtual WAN because this is going to fill a huge gap for customers <laughs> and potentially save them a whole like just ton of money. We're talking like All right. wheelbarrows full of money that potentially go out the door to other next generation firewall vendors. Sweet. So let's dive into this one too. What is the Azure Firewall and tell us how it's going to save me buckets and buckets of money? Because I want to go buy other stuff. Yeah. Uh, Azure Firewall is going to be a first party Microsoft managed uh, 100% cloud based network security service. So we're not talking about a device, right? We're, we're, we're talking okay. about a service. It's not, and, and the cool thing is that it's a service. It's not a virtual appliance either. It's a service, like, like a, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's, thing, so you can do this. So what it is is it is a native Azure service where you can create, do enforcement, logging, and configured network connectivity policies across one or more subscriptions and one or more Azure virtual networks. So it's a fully software defined firewall without any of the compute driving it. On the back end. So, the, the, the reason I say this is really cool and it could potentially save customers money is today, if you want a next gen firewall in Azure or really you want to do any kind of uh, NVA or network virtual appliance, you go out to the marketplace and you purchase it through the marketplace. So, if I'm going to do a firewall, just I'm going to do a couple of Palos, right? Like a Palo Alto and go yep. ahead and spin that up. Well, I got to go to the marketplace. I've got to purchase the Palo Alto, but that actually requires me to have a, a license for like the cloud version of Palo, which means I got to go out to Palo and get that license to be able to activate it. And in reality, what's happening is on the back end, it's not like there's some just obfuscated surface or service spinning up there's an actual vm that drives that so when you think about like functionality in azure compute and networking things like the ability to have multiple nics associated with the vm that was all born out of customers wanting to do these network virtual appliances and have like a front end and a back end plane and and do managed dmzs and, and kind of multi segment firewalls and and load balancers and, and and all that good kind of stuff so you're compute driven you're locked into what the vendor says for compute 
compute, there's updates, it can be a little more difficult to upgrade. You've got to think about things like ingress and egress and bandwidth limits on NICs and, and all this other stuff. And now this just kind of goes out the door. And it's going to give me some additional controls because within Microsoft's firewall service, I can actually do layer three connectivity policies. So I have full control now, layer three to layer seven. So like OSI kind of layer, right? So to run everything up from kind of the physical all the way down to the, or all the way up to the application layers. Very nice. So now, and I was looking at the pricing for this too, like right now when, they may change this once it gets out of preview, but it looks like it's 1.5 cents for every gigabyte inbound, 1.5 cents for every gigabyte outbound. If you're using this for a firewall, like you said, because you're not spinning up a virtual appliance, you're not dealing with compute, any of that, this is like dirt cheap to stand up and start using. Oh yeah, no, this is, this is like, this is nothing. Uh, so so yeah, you've got pricing up to like 10 terabytes of bandwidth and then above 10 ter, you start spending a little bit less money. Right, like a fraction of a penny. Yeah, so it, you know, it might be a little bit harder for you to figure out pricing because how much bandwidth am I actually going to push through this? What's it look like? All, all that good kind of stuff. But it should be it should be a very compelling pricing structure for the functionality that it's that it's going to offer you. So it's not going to be as full blown as again something like the Palo, right? I, I might spin up like a Cisco device or a Palo or a Checkpoint or something like that to go ahead and have that virtual appliance. Maybe do like Azure to Azure, or my cloud to ground connectivity. But maybe I don't need to do that because now I've got things like Express Route and virtual WAN. So let me spin that up. Let me have Microsoft Firewall and just go kind of first party across. The board and potentially get some really nice kind of savings or efficiencies in there. Theoretically, it should be easier for me to manage a PaaS service than it is to manage a whole big compute service and everything else that comes with it. Yeah, so does this have a list of features that are available in it yet in terms of various protection that's built out of the box? Is it simply just for uh, blocking certain ports? Does it have stuff like denial of service, detection, protection? Yeah. What kind of features are included in this Azure firewall? So let's kind of run through it. So because we're in Azure, there's a couple of things that happen at the edge before traffic ever hits your network. Particularly things like DDoS, those always sit at the edge. So you can purchase a like a premium DDoS Service from Microsoft, but that still sits outside your VNet, right? It's it's before traffic comes in and gets to you. So once traffic gets to your VNet and comes into you, you're going to have this service, which has built-in HA, which is super cool because there's no additional load balancers to configure. Because by the way, when you did those other NVAs or that other next gen firewall, yeah, you had to still configure your load balancers. You still had to have HA services, which you know doubled your price and pushed things up, right? Because Again, you were sitting in a virtual appliance. This is just a service. So there's yep. so this is a service. The other really cool thing about this one is it is theoretically they haven't published a limit for it, but it is unrestricted scalability. So you should be able to scale to accommodate any network traffic flow. So again, with those NVAs, you're limited and and you're capped by the amount of bandwidth that you can push through a NIC on a virtual machine because that appliance is a virtual machine. This is in a virtual machine, it's just sitting on the back end someplace so Microsoft can scale it a little bit differently. So those are two of the kind of big ones, right? Is I don't have to worry about HA anymore, it's built into the service, and I don't have to worry about scale. I do have to worry about cost because hey, I'm paying for the bandwidth, right? I'm paying like per gig that goes out up to you know X number of terabytes, things like that. But again, it makes it a really compelling model. So as far as features, it does have uh, fully qualified domain name filtering. So if you're doing uh, like outbound proxy filtering today, you could actually do that through this service, which again potentially lets you eliminate a proxy. So you got like Squid or, or you know like Blue Coats or something like that running in front of your services. Hey, you don't need that anymore. You can just go ahead and throw it in, throw it in here, all with you know weighted priorities, all that good 
kind of stuff. And it doesn't require any SSL termination or anything to do that. It's just traffic hits it and it's filtered or unfiltered. Beyond that, you can go ahead and do just straight network traffic filtering rules. So now within this service, because it's going to be a central service for you and it's natively joined into your VNet, you're going to have the ability to allow or deny network filtering rules by source and destination IP address, port, protocol, all that good kind of stuff. And because it's a firewall, it is fully stateful. So where things like network security groups, like NSGs, you know, people like to talk about it, NSGs or firewalls, NSGs are not firewalls. They're technically not stateful. They're, they're not doing any of that kind of stuff. They kind of sort of are, but they're not. It's not a firewall. This is a full-on firewall, 100% stateful so it's going to be able to do things like distinguish packets to different types of connections and then you'll get all the centralized logging and enforcement and and all that good kind of stuff it also has outbound uh, sourcenet or snet support so when you spin up the firewall service you're getting a dedicated static ip for your firewall so all your outbound virtual network traffic it's all going to be translated like as it's going out to your azure firewall firewall public IP, but you can still identify and allow traffic originating from that virtual network to like remote internet destinations because it, it is a static IP and it's it's all good and ready to go. And then logging, it's, it's all tied into Azure's backend. So you have native logging through either storage accounts, you can stream events to event hubs, which then you know you could go ahead and pump it into log analytics, send it to Splunk, push it wherever you want it to. You got like another seam, hey, have at it. Go ahead and surface it in Azure Monitor, alert on it, do all that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah, I was reading through some of the articles too about where you stand this up. It looks like you can even just stand up one of these and put it in front of a central VNet that goes off into spoke VNets. Or can you put this in front of multiple VNets, so one firewall with multiple VNets coming off that one firewall. Well, it's using the same kind of methodology that we would use to do NVAs today. So we're still in like these hub-spoke meshes and uh, you know Azure VNet peering is still non-transitive, all that kind of stuff. So there's a tag when you're doing your UDRs where you're defining like next hop within your routes, and you can actually have a user defined route and it says, hey, next hop's a virtual appliance. And this is still technically like treated that way. So you would still go ahead, peer your VNets, and you would say, hey, next hop out of VNet A over to the hub is going to be, you know, virtual appliance at this IP, because you're going to have a locked IP for your device, and, and go ahead and push all your traffic. Around and, and have it run up. So you're going to have to have connectivity between your VNets, but you can use this as kind of your outbound and inbound filtering mechanism all up across okay. the board. And add, can you add multiple static IP addresses then, or is it one static IP? Have they gotten that far into it yet? It's one static IP today to go ahead and push things around and, and get it to where it needs to be. Okay. All right, so if someone wants to go try this out, wants to enable it, start using it, are there steps of how you can enable the preview, get going with it, start configuring it, leveraging it? Yep, there's a couple of things that need to happen. It is a managed public preview. So what that means is when you go to enable this service, you need to use a little bit of PowerShell. You actually need to uh, register the provider for this service with the Azure PowerShell command let's so you've got you know uh, register Azure RM provider feature so you'll actually go ahead and spin up the firewall service that way Microsoft has guidance out there I'll make sure there's kind of links in the show notes but basically you're turning on a feature called allow regional gateway manager for security gateway and then another one for the firewall itself it takes a about 30 minutes to spin up. Uh, your mileage may vary. I've seen it happening a little bit less for the subscriptions I've been playing around with. With it, you'll go ahead and re-register your network provider after that. And then as soon as you've done that, you can go ahead and do a deployment. So you can run, unlike Virtual WAN, which didn't have support for our ARM templates right now, this one you can go ahead and deploy through Azure PowerShell, you can deploy it through a template, or you can deploy it through the portal. And they actually have a little bit of a walkthrough that kind of runs you through setting up a couple of VNets, doing the routing between them, and, and getting the default routes and, and everything in place. Okay, and it looks like out in 
GitHub already too, and the Azure Quick Start templates, they already have a template for it. That would be the ARM template. Yep. All sitting out there, ready to go. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Definitely something to go give a try, especially if you're using uh, firewall appliances now when you're looking to save a little bit of money on your Azure subscription. Yeah, no, I, I think this will be, uh, depending on what you're doing and how you're using things, and, and this could be a really big one. Sounds good. All right. Well, I think that anything else you want to talk about with the uh, virtual appliances, or not the virtual appliances, with SD WAN with the uh, firewall, or does that about cover it? No, I think that covers it for now. All right. Sounds good. We'll go enjoy the rest of your Friday. Next time I talk to you, I will have a, another baby in the house. Yay! <laughs> yeah! Fun stuff. All right. Well, thanks again, Scott. Another great episode. And we will talk to you later. All right. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.